Michelle, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, I love hearing stories from entrepreneurs about you know how they how they got to where they are, how their life has shaped to to what they've built um, in terms of a company, and even some of the the struggles are I think are always important for people to hear. Uh, it's not all you know, running through fields of roses all the time. <laughs> um, and even when you get to one place, it seems like there's there's always something else um, that I think are stumbling blocks or really opportunities for growth as well. But I love really going way back and starting with the, the context for uh, how that, how all life experiences have shaped you into how you become an entrepreneur and, and built your company. So if we go back to the beginning and talk about your first job or one of your very first jobs um, and how that sort of shaped you becoming an entrepreneur or skill sets that you learned from that or how it was a completely awful experience and like you learned absolutely nothing <laughs> from it. But I think starting from the beginning is always helpful for people to kind of see the, the road. Sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me and thank you everybody for coming out. I'm excited to be here. Um, so. When I think about my early jobs, uh, I grew up in Atlantic City. So I always worked in the service industry. I worked in a casino or, you know, at an ice cream place. Probably my most uh, I don't, notorious job and how I actually got into college was working at Hooters. I wrote about, uh, I know everybody just went right to my cup size, right? <laughs> standard, uh, not exactly the standard representative um, for working at uh, a place like Hooters where typically, you know, there's this prototype of a woman. I was a virgin feminist working at a place where sex was selling and women were selling it. And so I wrote about the dogma of sexuality and, and the types of stereotypes you might encounter um, growing up in Atlantic City. It, it was almost like a natural psychology course, really because you're in the service industry. So you're dealing with a lot of ego. Um, sometimes you're learning about entitlement um, from an interesting angle. So I think in a lot of ways, um, having that experience, I really sort of identified as an underdog. Um, when I started working with students with disabilities, um, I saw their struggle or the barriers that they experienced in their transition also as sort of being an underdog. So the, I guess the internal motivation for me was when I was shaking my fist to say people with disabilities could do more, it was also sort of that part of me of like expect more from me as well just because I grew up in Atlantic City, a uh, single mother in the service industry doesn't mean I can't do or be more. So I would kind of thank or be very grateful for that experience um, and that natural psychology course. I would say that also, you know, you gain a lot of insight to how people think in that process. And I've definitely drawn on uh, those insights throughout my journey as an entrepreneur, for sure, for better or for worse, yeah? Um. I, I agree with so much of what you said. Um, in full disclosure, I grew up in Cape May, New Jersey, so Michelle and I have the, the South Jersey shore town connection. I love yeah. <laughs> um, and, and two, worked in the customer service industry pretty much growing up. It was nice that there was always opportunities of summer work, um, and it's something that I feel like there should be these requirements of, of gosh, I sound old, but like kids these days, um, of working in a customer service industry. Because if you work in a restaurant, it, it humbles you. And when you have to um, you know, play the customer is always right game, that can really shape you. And whether that's really in a restaurant or a retail experience, but like having a forward-facing customer service job at a younger age, I, I do think helps shape things. Um, so I'm sure, or, or tell me if I'm wrong, that... Uh, Digitability was not the, I, you thought of this when you were 14 years old and you just ended up at the exact same spot of building the company. Um, so how did you get from there to launching Digitability? Um, and it would probably help to just give a little background about um, how the company is shaped uh, today and exactly what you're doing. Yeah, so um, I mentioned that I applied to college and, and writing about dogma and stereotypes. I actually applied to University of the Arts, and the dean of my program is here tonight. It's Neil Kleiman. Take a take a bow. Um, when I was when I was pursuing um, a degree at art school, it was a really 
new program that I was excited about it was a digital media program, right? So we were learning about streaming media before there was YouTube. Um, we were designing a social network for our university long before Facebook was a household name. And I felt really empowered by this experience of being able to not only learn about technology, but understand that I could use these new mediums to you know, have a voice, to express things that I thought about the world, um, to hear how other people um, would interpret my perspective or my view of the world. It was really exciting. And I thought that there was such a great opportunity to bring these emerging technologies into education. So I became a teacher in Philadelphia. And my intention was to start these sort of grassroots projects and programs around digital literacy here in Philadelphia. Um, I ended up working in special education because that's where the highest need was. And that's when I started to work with students with a wide range of disabilities, including autism. And what I realized was, you know, the students that I worked with had a, a broad range of interest and abilities, um, but they were all able to learn new skills. So I set the same bar for every student in the classroom, but adjusted the different supports. Um, and we actually entered a regional computer fair competition. And I always say this wasn't the Special Olympics of computer fairs. It was a very rigorous um, competition and event. And my students not only competed, but they ended up placing third in the multimedia category. This was a very big deal because we were the only special education classroom, let alone an autistic support classroom, to participate. So it was at this point that um, administrators at the, the district level noticed our project and started asking, you know, what's going on in your classroom? So I started doing teacher training sessions. I started presenting at conferences. And the more I did that, the more I realized or the more I was hearing from people that there was a need for this type of learning or this format of education, particularly for students with disabilities. So I reconnected with the dean of my university who had spearheaded a incubator program called the Corzo Center for the Creative Economy. And my struggle was trying to understand how I would scale what I had achieved with my students in the classroom um, to you know, students in other classrooms in Philly, in other states, and across the country. Um, and he told me, hey, you, know, you can go through this boot camp and you could win $10,000. And I remember thinking at the time, like, wow, $10,000. What would I ever do with $10,000? And then like halfway through, I was like, what am I going to do with $10,000? Um, I need more money, like <laughs> writing up more proposals. So um, I was able to build the beta. And, you know, as you probably know, there's always this shifting goalpost of what, you know, success looks like. So... In the beginning, success was having a working prototype. Um, then I had it. Then success would only be you know, when my students were using it and I could get their feedback. Then success would only be when other people were using it. Then when people were paying for it. You know, and today it's, OK, we have this great product. Now we need to amplify our message to really push boundaries and break down some of the social and psychological barriers that I'm starting to understand exist um, in you know, pursuing the mission that we have, which is to increase um, the inclusion of people with disabilities into the workplace. And I feel like that's a, a good lesson. I feel like that's a good lesson in the sense of <clears throat> celebrating the small wins. We talk about that in our team, or right? you have this moving goal line, and you don't want to just you know, look at the big vision and think, well, if I don't get there and build you know, a billion dollar company, then I somehow fail, and looking at how you can sort of build up along the way and celebrate those wins. Um, and in addition to shaping the whole piece of what the company was going to be, I feel like the being a public school teacher in Philadelphia is a lesson in resourcefulness, um, which is a good <laughs> lesson sure. to translate into how to be an entrepreneur and how do you do a lot with a little, um, especially, you know, if you really relate to that, oh, I have $10,000, so like, I could be able to build this entire company on only $10,000 right. and then getting to the point of, like, 
how do you build an actual technology yeah. and what does this program out with, uh, with marketing yep. things as well. Um, so was there a pivotal point um, through the process of uh, entering the Corzo uh, for Center for Creative Economy um, or at the school district? Was it winning the award? Was there like a, a light bulb moment, a pivotal moment that sort of like changed the course of you as a person and being an entrepreneur or changed the course of digitality? Um, so when I, okay, when I think of um, light bulb moments, um, I think of, uh, in my personal journey, um, I think of the challenges that I've had in sort of getting the message of what my intention is across clearly so that everybody else could understand what it is that I was trying to say. Um, so I have a story. When I was in, I was in Washington, D.C., we were piloting the program at the D.C. Public Library. And the director of assistive technology invited me out um, to a happy hour for, I think it's like Center City Sips. It's the version of Center City Sips. Um, so he's like, oh, come on out. You can meet my girlfriend. So we all meet up at this bar. And there's about 14 people that are joining us for this happy hour. And of the 14, only four of us had sight. So 10 people were blind. And one of the uh, people this happy hour um, was a developer for the FCC. And he said, you know, Patrick's been telling me all about your new innovation. Uh, I'd love to hear more. And so as I started to talk about my company to him at, the po at that point, I started to become aware of um, a certain level of discomfort because I had never engaged with somebody in a conversation that was blind. And here I am working with the disability community, right? But this was a very new experience. And I found myself wondering, well, how come their clothes match? And how does their makeup look so good? And how did they know to get here? And they greeted their guest. Um, they always know what wine glass is theirs, you know? They're not sipping on mine. And I thought, okay, now I get it. This is why when I'm sitting here trying to convince people that you know, somebody who's nonverbal or somebody who has autism can learn to code, why it's such a hard pill to swallow or why we have these social and psychological barriers because uh, fully empathizing with somebody who has a different level of sensory perception, right? We try to empathize with people of different experiences that level of sensory perception is probably the most difficult thing to do, like to, to imagine waking up every day and not being able to see and, and live my, or complete my daily routine would be really challenging. So whenever we're talking about um, sort of trying to identify with other people's experiences to have a more diverse perspective or have a more inclusive um, world, I, I try to remember that we all have those barriers, right? We all have those um, biases that are just innate because we have a brain that processes information in patterns and we tend to align with patterns that are familiar. So that aha moment, right, when you're kind of righteously out there shaking your fist and, and trying to be an activist for so long and then being like, oh, huh, it humbles you, you know, and you start to think, okay, you have to meet people where they're at and you have to kind of give a little wiggle room if you're really going to have an impact. Yeah. Um, you're actually doing a nice little segue into my next question, um, which is really of what, what motivates you. Because uh, the world of entrepreneurship has highs and lows. And I think before I was an entrepreneur, in my former life, I was an attorney. So like a wildly different world. And the highs and lows of entrepreneurship, people talk about them in weeks. People talk about them in days. I actually think it's more like hours. Like within hours of your day, you can get have a great conference call or get a great email or, or you even get a deal done in the morning and then you try to go away for lunch and like something explodes um, and a, a deal falls apart and it's like the second you put the fire out over here like one pops up on the other side um, so there's there's a lot of, of highs and lows which are why things like you know sessions like this are important for everybody to to feel like we're all in this together um, and share those experiences so you have to have something that really deeply motivates you i have yet to meet a single entrepreneur that tells me it's the money 
Nobody has ever said like, oh man, that really steady paycheck that I, that huge amount that I pay myself every month is really the reason I get out of bed every day. There's always some underlying motivator of why, why you don't just walk away from the, the next fire that erupts. Um, so what is it for you uh, to keep building your company, you know, overcome these obstacles uh, and, you know, keep striving as a successful entrepreneur? Yeah, uh, you're right. You definitely need something deeply motivating you if you're going to continue to uh, jump over these hurdles because there's definitely going to be a brick wall and you have to figure out how to um, build a ladder, knock it down, walk around it, whatever it is. Um, I, I think I go back to sort of uh, that underdog framework. I... Uh, you know, even as an entrepreneur, right? Here's something I set out to do that's been very difficult. Um, I realized that my experience of trying to navigate this unfamiliar territory, this new experience, um, is very much like the journey of my students, right? They're learning to navigate um, the rules to this world and they don't always have the language or they don't even know what the hidden norms are. Um, they're not picking up on the signals. Being an entrepreneur is certainly a very similar experience. You're learning uh, the language, you know, when you're pitching to your investors or when you're trying to sell to customers. So there's this sort of vulnerability. And the more you experience failure, um, you know, that vulnerability can become, you know, a strength for sure. Um, so as I'm kind of on my own journey, or anybody is on their journey, if, if you're pursuing something that you really believe in, um, just having that empathy for other people, I think really strengthens and motivates to know that, you know, whatever it is that, whatever brick wall is in front of you, um, everybody around you is facing some other, their own brick wall, right? And, and how we sort of share resources or empathize with each other only strengthens us in those moments when we're vulnerable to sort of push through it. And I think that's important and somewhat specific to building a company in Philadelphia. Right? You need a lot of perseverance in terms of being an entrepreneur. People talk about building a company here as opposed to Boston, you know, the Valley, um, New York, that there's a lot more hurdles that you come up in an environment like this. Uh, nobody would ever usually call me an optimist, but I do like to think of building a company in Philadelphia. I'm more of a like a pragmatist. I'm more practical than an optimist. I wouldn't like to say I'm a pessimist. But in in building a company in Philadelphia, uh, and I would I consider myself a Philadelphian now. And even when I grew up in South Jersey, it was you know this was the city that you relate to. Like we are literally gritty, right? Like there's there, gritty. There's a level of grit and perseverance that. Uh, this the city has, and when we come together as entrepreneurs and building that community, that I think it's a level that we can we have much more than a lot of other cities have because we always really play that underdog card, which are like a lot of things that came out in the the sports of <laughs> of Philadelphia in, the, in 2018. Um, so talking about what motivates you is you know the highs of of what gets you out of bed every day and what helps you continue to build this company. I hate using the word regret. I like I really don't believe in regrets as a whole, but there's certainly things along my path that like I I may have turned left instead of turning right during those periods, but inevitably you you'll get to the place that you were intended to go, but are there um lessons that you learned over the course of your journey or things where you thought gosh, I'm, I I should have played that out a little bit differently? Uh yeah, a ton. Um I I think the, to say a regret, I think when you are at let's, the highs and lows, right? It's like a roller coaster ride. There's highs and lows. And when you're at a low, for me personally, you know, I feel my most vulnerable. And I think um, I would want somebody else to tell me what it is that I should do or what's the best path forward. Um, and the times where you went left instead of right, I think the times where I did what somebody else suggested against my own instinct or intuition are the times that would be, you know, quote unquote, a regret. 
in hindsight, right? Hindsight's always 2020. Um, but recognizing that and, and remembering that really, uh, you know, hones in on your intuition a bit better and, and teaches you to trust it. And of course, you want advisors, and of course, you want input. But I think at the end of the day, what people, um, you know, the choices that people suggest are the choices that they would ultimately make. And you really have to um, figure out what's right for you and what's true for you because it's your journey. Um, and, and I guess related to that, do you feel like there's times during your journey that you were treated differently because you were a female? <laughs> And, and how do you react to those situations? <laughs> oh, we probably need like two more hours to talk about this. Um, constantly, 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 constantly. Um, and I become, so I'm, I'm really big on language, right? Um, there's, a, there's a linguist that I um, read when I was in college named Michael Agar. And he says the language that you use is the the substructure for your culture and your consciousness. So I've become so sensitive to the language that people use where I can just pick up their subconscious biases. And it's very frustrating when you hear the, the gender specific ones towards women. Um, I guess my, my most famous story that I told in a, a TED talk was, I was at an open access event in Philly. I don't know if anyone's ever been to an open access event, but um, a friend of mine at the time, uh, Stacy Mosley, was an engineer for the city of Philadelphia. And she did this whole presentation on, on the data that she had managed um, working for the city. And at the end of her talk, you know, there was some networking. Um, there, there was also a process where everybody in the crowd would introduce themselves and they went through person by person and, and somebody decided to do like a six degrees of separation to showcase just how tightly uh, woven the Philadelphia community is. So he just kept naming people in the audience that he knew. And when it came to me and Stacy, he said, you know, I know Stacy and Michelle from Bob Moore's birthday party and they're excellent dancers. So we laughed and then at the end of the night, um, you know, everybody was networking. So a man came up to me who was in the audience, and he's like, oh, Michelle, I, I heard you talk at a UPenn event. Um, my son wants to be an engineer, and since you're friends with Stacy, I would love to connect with her and learn about her experience. So I said, oh, yeah, come on up. I'll introduce you. So, you know, Stacy was talking to a bunch of people. We reconnected, and we kind of had this moment where we, like, giggled, you know, about being great dancers. And uh, the man sort of joined in with us and said, uh, well, good thing you're an entrepreneur and Stacey's an engineer. Otherwise, you might have just been portrayed as some dancing bimbos. <laughs> and, right, like being from Atlantic City, I'm like, oh my, Th three and four letter words in my head, right? And I'm smiling, looking at him and Stacey, and we're kind of just paused for a minute. And I think I said something like, well, that's a very interesting response. And the thing is, the most important part of the story is that the man was immediately humiliated with, with, without even saying like, you know, without Atlantic City coming out at all. Like the man was humiliated. And the issue isn't what he said. It's that he didn't understand the comment until he said it out loud, right, in front of two women. And so nobody ever thinks they're the bad guy. No one ever thinks that they have this, you know, uh, bias, right? We sort of villainize biases. Um, but the truth is they're just a part of our natural biological process. The challenge for everybody is to become aware of them, right? Um, to sort of slow down the rapid fire that happens in the brain. Um, so, you know, there's some of that happening, but if you just look at the numbers, I'm all about like bottom line now, um, less than 3% of venture capital goes to women and minorities. So where's the other 97% going? And again, it's part of that, um, you know, the cultural differences between men and women. Some studies will show, you know, uh, hubris isn't necessarily a natural characteristic for some women. So if we come up and present or pitching a business, we may, um, you know, display characteristics that could be interpreted as, you know, being less secure, um, which might then be interpreted as a, a riskier or a less successful entrepreneur. Um, but then there's other research to show how much more successful women-led businesses actually are. So time and time they, they again. They produce much better returns, actually, with yes. that tiny 2% of the, 2-3% yep. of 
funding, um, yeah, statistically speaking, it's much higher returns for VCs. Yeah. Um, I was reading an article the other day uh, along similar lines that in the wake of the Me Too movement, um, it was specifically focused on really like Wall Street and that there was a lot of people in finance that um, men who were traditionally in these higher executive positions have since chosen to just not interact with females because they didn't want to risk the backlash of what would happen. So it, they had rules where like, I just don't, I won't meet with a female in my office. I won't go to dinner with them um, unless we're in a larger setting. Like I would never ask them out for drinks after work, which I think presents its own barriers of ways that you are to climb the corporate ladder. Part of that is done in the, the social ladder perspective. Um, any other advice for female entrepreneurs in how to, how to confront those subconscious bias? I've certainly had similar experiences where then, you know, you replay the conversation to yourself like 25 times in your head and you're like, I wish I would have had that snappy comeback at the time. But instead you're just kind of sort of stunned that like this is the reaction that, that people are saying during this. Um, so I'm usually a, like, Take the take the bull by the horns thing. Now yeah, um, I think I've gotten a little bit more aggressive in my responses a lot of times. Absolutely. I mean, that's been my own sort of shift, right? Growing up in the service industry, where you're sort of from a young age trained to just smile and nod, right? You learn to be very bold. You learn to push back and kind of just draw attention to some of the biases that people have. Um, so yes, I have definitely followed in that <laughs> pattern of like take the bull by the horn and just sort of put it out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, into more uh, positive now forward looking <laughs> topics. Uh, let's talk about goal setting yeah. of like 2018 is almost over, which I cannot believe. Um, are, is there anything else milestone wise that you want to achieve in 2018? What's the goal for 2019? And then where do you see yourself, digibility, 5, 10, 15 years from now? What's the pathway? Yeah, so it's we're at a really exciting um, inflection point in the growth of our company. And, you know, I've been an advocate of digital literacy for, you know, populations that have been traditionally marginalized more than a decade, maybe two decades at this point, if you trace it all the way back. Um, we're starting to see a really significant shift in the culture and the perceptions around disability in the workplace. In fact, there was just a big report that was published by Accenture that showed that the Fortune 500 companies that are embracing disability in the workplace are making more money, right? And I can say that like three different ways, shareholders, gross margins, um, but there's all these other benefits, but the bottom line is that they're more productive at um, sort of their roles in the company. There's higher retention rates and all that equates to more money. There's also sort of these anecdotal stories where CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies are talking about their improved communication abilities because they have to make things more explicit and how that actually elevates the whole entire organization. There's something called the curb cut effect. Um, you know, when you're walking down the sidewalk, you'll notice right before you hit the street, the curb is cut out. And that's because of the um, Americans with Disabilities Act that was passed in the 70s. So the curb cut effect is that while this, um, this feature in the sidewalk was implemented based on legislation to support people who were in wheelchairs, it also helped women who had strollers. Um, when you're traveling and you're dragging your luggage, if you have a large shipment, um, you're moving you know, big pieces of furniture. So by thinking about the most vulnerable, uh, the, the needs of the most vulnerable, you actually create a better system for everybody. So since we've kind of been, a, been ahead of the curve in all of that, we're positioned really well, where you know state departments of education are reaching out to us because there aren't a lot of programs that think about students with the most intense needs the way we do. Um, and I think for 2019, we're really working on amplifying that message. So now that we're seeing this trend, you know, this shift, we understand that it does take time um, for sort of everybody else to come on board and, and recognize and break down some of those social and psychological barriers. Um, so if 
anybody here would like to join that process, we would welcome a conversation. Um, part of, of, of how we're trying to do that is to connect with organizations that employ people, right? So if you work for an organization that employs people, we just want to understand what are the core functions of any job in your organization so that we can build a better training system that will actually model what happens in your workplace? And that's what we do in a nutshell. And so we have this core foundation that covers digital literacy, workplace behavior, some of those really nuanced topics, even financial literacy, but we wanna customize it. Um, and so those are the types of conversations we're having now, and that's sort of the trajectory for the next year is to really build and expand those partnerships. That's amazing. Um, what's some of the best advice you've ever received, and perhaps if it exists, some of the worst advice you've received on your uh, trek to becoming a successful entrepreneur? Um, for a successful entrepreneur, I don't know. I, so when I think of best advice and, and worst advice, I think of my family advice, sort of because they're a huge um, support system in my life. You need a support system, first of all, if you're gonna take on any uh, big mission, or especially a startup or anything entrepreneurial, you definitely need those people that are gonna tell you, like, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, you know, um, kind of riding those waves with you. Um, uh, I think some of the most important advice, and this is really for me personally, I think in terms of, you know, those vulnerabilities that I talked about. Um, the worst advice is when people suggest behavior that would enable abuse of some kind, right? Whether it's implicit or explicit. The best advice is to never take abuse from anybody. And so my aunt was the one who would kind of send that message to me and she would say, never accept abuse from anyone, even if it's from me. And that even if it's for me is the most important part because again, the way we think about behavior, mental health, disability, is very sensationalized. So to accept the reality that people are people and that we exhibit all types of behaviors um, allows us to go beyond some of the sensationalism of how we label each other. And I think that really gets down to the, the core um, sense of empathy, is to really understand people's experiences. When, whenever you have a startup, um, most of your selling being successful at selling is listening. So you really have to have empathy to be a good listener because once you get to the point where people are talking to you and you have that level of empathy, you're gonna immediately see what's behind their questions. So when I'm dealing with an administrator in education and they, they are asking me certain questions, I know right away what population they're most concerned about. Um, what characteristics of, of students with disabilities they're most familiar with. So I don't know, I know that was kind of like a roundabout advice, but um, that was for me personally, and I think it's had a tremendous impact on how I interact with people and how I kind of understand where people are at, which has made me successful in developing the relationships that I've had. And I just have to echo the support system piece mm -hmm. and how crucial that is to um, building a company and growing a company, having that be a support system of friends, um, other entrepreneurs, and family especially, the people that you're going to be around the most. Um, literally, for better or for worse, my husband is also an entrepreneur, and in a lot of ways it's great because I don't have to explain much about the highs and lows, and he totally gets it. On the other hand, we experience the highs and lows of that um, to, together, and that, that's, you know, if I'm on a high and he's on the low, there's a lot of this, like, I don't really want to share how great my day was because it <laughs> sounds like everything's awful on your side. Um, but either way, uh, I just had to echo that because I think it's tremendously important to have um, a really strong support system, and that can be in a number of different circles of having the friend group, a totally not friends and family, it could just be a small entrepreneur group, but find that, stick with it, it'll evolve over time, um, but having the support system is tremendously important. Absolutely. 
Um, so one other thing that I think most entrepreneurs wish for in addition to a great support system is more hours in the day. Um, it's, there's always this balance of being an entrepreneur and taking care of yourself so that you can also take care of the company, making sure that you're eating right, making sure that you're sleeping sometimes, and a lot of those things go out the window during uh, different seasons, I call them, as you're going through different phases. Um, are there tips that you have for time management? Are there apps that you really like that you use? Um, what are what are your things for that? Mine's my my calendar. Like if it doesn't end up on my calendar, I'm not showing up. I'm not coming to the conference call. Like it has to be there, especially because I don't have a home office and I bounce around literally the Northeast corridor, not just not just Philadelphia. So it's literally like get on a train in 15 minutes, right. like go to this place. Right. What are what are the things that you use to help keep track? So. It's it's the same uh, when it comes to my calendar to the point where my boyfriend and I have now like dinner at seven o'clock on the calendar by a Christmas tree on Saturday from two to three. Um, it, it's that real um, when you have that many hats to wear and people to manage. Um, there are some apps, and uh, just like shout out product placement. There's a really simple Swiss. We're not sponsored. No, by we're anybody, really not. No. But, <laughs> but I really, for me, uh, organization. I don't know why I should not be giving any advice on organization, but um, this one app in particular has been extremely helpful, and it's super simple. It's called To Do, but like the French spelling, like To Do. It's a Swiss app, and all it is is a list maker on your computer. So like growing up, just writing things down, crossing them off, crossing them off. This is something where I put all of my tasks and then I move them from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's all you do. When you're done, you click on it, it crosses it out. The thing that goes along with that, the strategy, and I read about this from like, I don't know, Rockefeller, somebody who advised the Rockefeller. This is an article I read in the New York Times. If you take a list maker like this and you pick um, three tasks, and your goal for the day is to complete just those three tasks, you're supposed to be the most productive person in the world, right? Um, that's really hard to do. So if you set off in the morning, you're like, okay, I'm gonna do this because it's low hanging fruit. Um, maybe you get that done and the next one's a little bit bigger, but then a call comes through or a fire needs to be put out. Um, it seems so simple, these three things. And, and what this article said to do was focus all of your energy on completing that first thing, then the second thing. Um, so when I have the sort of um, emotional cognitive space, I try to implement that. But the reality is, um, you know, you're multitasking all the time. So uh, I would recommend that. I, I have one other tool I just started using called Monday. And they got me, man. They heavily marketed to me on my Instagram, on my YouTube. Like I was seeing this app everywhere for about three months until I actually signed up. But I really like it. So that's another one I would suggest. They, <laughs> I, they must have been... They, yeah, they were targeting me too, yeah. pretty heavily. Yeah. Um, it must have been because I'm constantly Googling, like, how do I make more time in the day? Right. Um, and they came up with Monday. Our team uses Asana, which I love very much, that. but it looks like Monday is sort Way of better. like Slack on, or um, Asana on crack a little bit. What uh, I like about better. it is it's super visual because it's color coded. So imagine you have a hundred tasks in front of you, right? Or let's say they're in five different boards. Divide that, 25, right? So 25, all I need to do is say, okay, these are all green. This one's yellow here. This one's red. So everything that's green I know is done by somebody. Um, if it's yellow, there's a quick note. So instead of weeding through the entire project, I just, boom, my eye goes right to the thing that I need to know. So that's why I like it. Maybe we'll get a Monday sponsorship and <laughs> keep talking yeah. about it. Um, so say you, you have your Monday board and, and you're looking good. You've actually gotten three things done for yeah. the day. Um, say it's a Friday and we're rolling into the weekend. What do you do to decompress? What do you do to, to relax and sort of get, get your productivity flowing again? Yeah, so I, uh, I like to hike. It's a little cold right now. Um, I say that I run. But I haven't really run in a, I haven't gone running in a while. Um, yeah, I think I, I did. I did run. Okay, my director of marketing shares a calendar with me, so knows everything I do. Yeah. So I, I like I like being in nature, and then other at times it's just like a hot bath and a book. 
Um, I have an adorable puppy. I like to play with my dog. My boyfriend is great. We, you know, go out to dinner. Um, concerts. I just met my favorite artist, Alan Stone. I got to hug him. It was like, I got a little too excited. Ended up getting blackout drunk somehow. Don't know how that happened. Ha Shout out to my boyfriend for getting me home safe. <laughs> uh, so concerts, we like a lot of music. Um, okay, we're gonna roll into our uh, rapid fire question piece. Okay. So I'm just gonna give you uh, two responses, pick a response, shout it out, and then we're gonna roll into our question and answer so you guys can start thinking about that. Um, and actually I lied, it's not two responses. Some of them are just one or two word answers. Okay. Uh, last book you read? Like last one finished or reading now? Uh, finished. Uh, Mary Crow Dog. Uh, it's a, I'm Native American, so it's a book by a Native American woman sort of talking about uh, history and uh, some of the revolutions that they participated in. Um, you might have hinted at this one, dogs or cats? Uh, I have both, but my dog has an Instagram. You can follow him at Frank Ladelphia. <laughs> um, coffee or tea? Coffee. Uh, night owl or early riser? I'm a night owl, and society discriminates against us, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> like, my, my, sometimes my most productive hours are, like, between 7 at night and 1 in the morning. I am the complete opposite. I'm an <laughs> early riser. I can get done between the hours of 5 and 8 a.m., like my entire day's work. But trying to do work for me after like 10 p.m. is just, mm. I'm done. I'm fried. Probably because I'm up at 5 a.m. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, biggest pet peeve? Uh, I guess hearing some of the subconscious biases that people uh, use in their language. I also don't like when people put their hands in their mouth. <laughs> um, okay, last one. Lyft or Uber? Uh, Lyft. Me too. Um, well, I think as a woman, I think we just all at once boycotted them. So right? that I actually made our entire company switch from a corporate Uber account to a corporate Lyft account during that whole thing and pressured my husband and pretty much anybody else I knew to switch over to a Good Lyft call. account as well. Um, so we're going to open up to Q&A now. Any burning questions? So I have two videos because I have a developer that is primarily just making websites so that they can be really accessible. I have other developers that sell their contributors, but it's very it's a little bit disappointing. But um just hearing about your work and uh curious uh things what kind of experiences um do you see uh the team that you work with or people you support or It's a great question. So um, we talk about legislation sort of being the push that changes uh, culture. And when you think about the Americans with Disabilities Act being passed in the 70s, and consider how long it takes for the culture to shift. And I'll just, one example, I started teaching in 2008 where students were still in the basement, right? They were completely segregated. I had to literally take a wall down in the gym so that my students could play with the other students during gym time. So that was 30 years later. Um, most of what those laws have focused on are physical disabilities, right? So the curb cut effect, Braille, a sort of new wave of cognitive accessibility is what we're really talking about. So how do you make things cognitively accessible? And this was a really big um, challenge for me starting out early as an entrepreneur and developing my product. So I had that $10,000 and I had to, to build a product. And the first bit of advice was, why don't you just use one of those authoring tools? And immediately I said, well, how we're gonna have to create a whole other program on how to navigate content in an authoring tool, right? So we had to be extremely intentional about the interface that we designed and the user experience. So considering the nuance and the processes for somebody um, who has you know, neurodiverse needs. Um, so I don't see a lot of that. Um, so our, our, 
our program is intentionally designed that way. And then what we do through our interface is we make the digital literacy training super explicit and we use principles of applied behavior analysis um, to ensure that skills transfer. So what skill transfer means is you learn in our simulation how to send an email in Gmail, right? You click this button and then you enter the text into the field or you use Google Drive, you learn to collaborate in the cloud, then can you transfer that into the real environment? Then add on the social interaction that happens in that environment with a real person. Um, so that's sort of a, a very nuanced process of unpacking things that are super intuitive. And the analogy I always use is, um, tell me how you brush your teeth in the morning. Mm-hmm. Yep. Got it. Sound great. You brush your teeth every morning. And so you identify maybe five major steps to that process. But the reality is you are picking up your toothpaste with your left hand. You're taking your thumb and your forefinger, pinching the cap and turning it counterclockwise three times. You're placing it. So unpacking all of those things that have been a part of a very intuitive process to us is how you make things cognitively accessible. It, it, and it seems so simple, right? Like tell somebody how to brush their teeth, right? But once you unpack it, you're like, oh, there's a whole other set of things we really need to think about. Great question, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Mariah in the back. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's hard. Um, so at first it's like bringing awareness to what you're feeling, right? So say this girl, I'm like, I don't like this girl. <laughs> well, why don't I like this girl? What, what, what do I feel right now? What is it? What is the behavior that she's exhibiting that's making me feel uncomfortable? If you go through the process and you go deep enough, you'll probably realize that Whatever is, is bothering you is something unresolved within yourself. And, and so it's like a muscle, right? So first you have to recognize it's happening. Then you have to um, kind of think about why it's happening. And then you kind of have to flex the muscle to interrupt that automatic emotion that comes as a result of it. Just like lifting a weight and straight. And the more you do it, the, the stronger that process gets and the more aware you become. And that's how you get to empathy, right? That's how you get to hear somebody and, and meet them where they're at. And once you meet somebody where they're at, then you have so much more influence. You have such a, a greater ability to share something meaningful that you really believe in. Yeah, good question. Thank you. It's hard. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not. Because it's much easier for me to be like tell you all the reasons why I don't like that person, <laughs> right? And then have you say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I see it, you know? Then be introspective. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, and who has the time for all that right. too, right? Like, oh, man, now I have to worry about this. <laughs> but it's important. It really is important. Only if you use Monday, then you can yeah. schedule your time for introspection throughout your day. Right, right, right. I could be a great like podcast host and just insert sponsorship <laughs> dialogue through it. That'll um, be the next startup. Yes, right, yeah. yes. Um, other questions, London. Yeah, so I think it's an explicit conversation. Um, you know, sometimes it's being bold or maybe a little gangster at times, like uh, reminding people uh, that I'm the boss. Also, I don't know if anyone watches um, uh, House of Cards, but the last season was very much this theme of people undermining her authority in a way that they never did to the male president which is something that women experience. And again, this is, in, this is the subconscious bias, right? It's a behavior that's a result of subconscious bias. So sometimes it just takes like, I'm gonna do what I want, 
<laughs> or, uh, you know, you're going to respond, you know, but it, it's being direct without being, you know, so honoring that person and understanding, like, they're a valuable member to the team and these things don't have to be uncomfortable. They just have to be addressed. And when you have you know, thoughtful people on your team or you're building a team and a culture, um, they'll respond, right? They'll, they'll respond to you and you, under, you, you basically are setting a new boundary. So the, the best advice and worst advice about abuse, that's all about boundaries. It's about understanding what your boundaries are, um, what somebody, if somebody else recognizes that boundary or not. Um, if they didn't, well, then the opportunity is there to explicitly communicate the boundary and, and understand and agree to it that you both recognize it's there now. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Did you have another question? So like people who have like ableism, like views of ableism. Yeah, so I'm all about meeting people where they're at and sometimes it's listening to them to see where the flaw is in the logic. Um, kind of understanding what their experience has been or I, I, <clears throat> when you haven't been exposed to somebody with a disability, right? Like I, that's where the biases come in. So just like the story when I was down in DC and I hadn't been exposed to a lot of people who were blind and hadn't had the opportunity to interact, that's why I didn't understand that they could come to this happy hour completely independently, order a drink, see their friends. Um, figuring out where the baseline is and then sort of talking to that and sort of pushing their boundaries a little bit is kind of the process. Sometimes it's... Um, so even when I was a teacher, for example, um, I was a huge fan of inclusion. So I wanted my students to have an experience outside of my classroom, um, whether it was in an art class or a math, whatever class it was. I found myself shaking my tiny fist in the face of teachers and very much <laughs> diplomatically saying, my students will be in your classroom because it's their civil right. And you preventing them is a, viol is a big violation, and I'm not going to stand for it. Um, so sometimes it's a diplomatic push, uh, you know, and they responded to that. And the, the thing is, once you push a little bit, you know, those same teachers who were like, I don't know, it's, it's fear, right? Once they're, and the, the, um, the, the number one intervention for fear and anxiety is exposure, 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 exposure. So as soon as they had that student in their classroom, they 100% of the time, like clockwork, came back to me and said, I love Deshaun, Lamar's the most amazing person in the world, you know? Once they were exposed and they understood that this was nothing to be fearful of, that it was an amazing experience and would elevate their entire classroom, then they got it. And now they would go forth into the world with that experience and have the opportunity to advocate, right, for other people. Um, that's how we got the wall down. And, and the wall wasn't all at once. We first had one student that went over. Then we had two students that went over. And then finally we took down the wall and there was a level playing field, right? It was, it was an open gym for everybody. And then our students were playing the, the football games with all the other students. So it was step by step in a lot of cases, but when I left teaching, it was full immersion. Like, so full, fully inclusive, everybody played together. Um, but it, it took time, and, it, and it's really people getting past their own subconscious fears, biases. Yeah, so we're, we're less concerned with any given label, like autism or emotional disturbance, and we're more focused on the characteristics in cognition and behavior. So one example that maybe everybody can relate to is anxiety, right? So everybody in here has experienced anxiety. Um, the degree to which you experience a behavior, the way you measure behavior is by intensity, duration, and frequency. So maybe you feel intense anxiety before you go up to present. 
Um, or do you feel anxiety frequently at every social interaction? Um, is that frequent anxiety so intense that you are completely debilitated and shut down? Or is it so long that you can't do anything for days? So whenever we're talking about behavior, we would measure it um, in those terms. So any part of the human experience, right, in, involves cognition, a cognitive process or a behavioral process. The message that we're trying to sort of, or the, the, the social, attitudinal, psychological barrier that really lies beneath this, this conversation is in our society, we have this idea that people with disabilities are sort of this unique group of people. And the reality is every characteristic that they have is something we all have, right? How their brain filters and how their brain processes information may be different, but ultimately the things that we're teaching are the same things that every single person in this room needs to understand in order to be independent. How we get to mastering those skills, the process is um, different. So, our program breaks down all of those processes in a way to support a wide range of needs, whether it's a behavioral need, whether it's a, a language, an expressive or receptive language need. Um, so really, any type of need out there. So aggression, right, um, what, what you'd be talking about is developing a strategy or skill for the process of self-regulation, right? So the reason that when that guy said something, I didn't punch him in the face, right? Self-regulate. Um, yeah, so learning self-regulation, we, uh, part of our program, it's our, it's our workplace behavior program. So what we do is we um, teach behaviors that make you successful in the workplace, and then we teach behaviors that can be problematic in the workplace. And the idea is by identifying both types of behavior, you learn to recognize uh, or distinguish Right, what's appropriate or expected and what's not expected in the workplace. And then we use principles of applied behavior analysis. There's a behavior modification component to it where students are actually earning money for the behaviors they exhibit and then have a budget for the amount they can spend. So when I taught um, a learning support classroom, so um, these are students who might have what we would call non-apparent disabilities. Um, so some behavioral issues, right? Disabilities that are non-apparent are non-apparent until they are. Until the student is a situation where you see like, oh, there's a need here. Um, I could, at South Philadelphia High School, if the budget was $7, technically I could get cursed out six times. But if they stopped at six, then they had met a boundary and they were developing their self-regulation. And then what we did is we cut that back to four. Right? Because if, if you're neuro neurologically wired to have impulsive behavior or you've had um, some experience that led to aggressive tendencies, it's not gonna happen overnight. Right? There's a process to developing, just like flexing that muscle. So it's, again, meeting people where they're at, meeting the student where they're at, and then putting an intervention in place that incrementally um, shows progress. Yes? So so by day, I'm a, I'm a general manager for a pharmaceutical business, and by night, I'm Batman running a startup. <laughs> but, but one of the questions I love to ask people, because I do a lot of hiring, is um, it tells me a lot about where they are is to describe, is they look back over their lives. Tell me, what is the one trophy event? Everybody has a trophy event that's on the shelf of their lives that they look at it and go, wow. I can't believe I did that. It's something I will never, ever forget. And, and it's always there. It's a shiny piece of metal that they're just so proud of. As you look at digitability, can you tell me what was the one trophy event that you're extremely proud of that, I mean, if you were to, God forbid, leave this earth today, it would be the one testament that you lived. Hiring me. Uh, oh, no, no. What was it? Was so obvious. Oh, Hiring me. <laughs> Honestly, my answer is like, I don't have it yet. But um, yeah, I mean, I that shifting goalpost, right? Like I'm, the impact I'm trying to have is at scale. Um, you know, when we look at the statistics on unemployment for people with disabilities, less than 30% of people with, 
with disabilities are employed. And with autism, it's less than 20. Our first graduating program, our first graduating cohort, 70% um, of our first graduating cohort achieved employment. So this shows us that it's not because they can't work, right? What's disappointing um, is that we've had decades, right, of um, organizations providing services to people with disabilities since the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed and we really haven't changed that number. We're trying to do something different, something that will really um, move the needle. So in, until I have that you know, scaled, which I think we're getting there, um, that'll be my shining trophy. <laughs> Yeah. This is an interesting uh, uh, problem because as I'm listening to you talk and respond to that last set of questions in your current trophy challenge, currently, as I, as I understand your, your program and your software, you're working with those who are, who are challenged and disabled in order to, to introduce them and prepare them to master uh, the culture of the majority class. So those of us who are more normalized. But if you want to change uh, uh, that majority class, you have to make it possible for us to understand the problem that everybody has when they open up a tube of toothpaste. Uh, so the question is, have you ever thought of developing an app in which the quote, and I use the word air quotes, normal, those who are not challenged, can experience what it is to be challenged in their daily routine? that they begin to understand, and not merely in a rhetorical way, but in a real way, what it's like to walk in those footsteps and see the world that way. Yes, and so you and I have had a conversation about virtual reality not, not too long ago, but even before that, right, even before, like, I don't know if anybody watches Black Mirror, um, but even before um, those types of interventions, one of the things that we're working to do is to build that ecosystem um, so that there's reciprocity, right? So while we're training individuals to understand how to navigate, you know, workplace norms, excuse me, we're also educating the people in that workplace what it means to be a person with neurodiverse needs. So as I mentioned, one of our goals um, in 2019, you know, to partner with more employers or, and understand the types of roles that exist, the more students we are successfully preparing for the workplace, the more we are placing people um, in companies that, that are like these Fortune 500 companies that are embracing neurodiversity, that's when we then expand the conversation to say, not just your HR team, but a scalable education system for every employee in the company. So if you're entering, you know, a Sprint store or any, any company, you know, anywhere, you understand, you can recognize some characteristics of a person with diverse cognitive or behavioral needs. Um, so for example, if somebody was pacing back and forth, right, you might recognize that um, they're a person who could be on the spectrum or have some sensory processing issues and maybe they're agitated. Um, so you would learn how to engage that person. Um, so yes, that's definitely something we think about. It's both ends of, of developing the training and it would be scalable in the same way. Add one more sentence. Mm -hmm. The irony is, is that almost all of us are on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us just don't recognize it or are not recognized as being on the spectrum. And so the degree in which, as you're talking about being in a, in a store and watching people face, et cetera, employers, employees, you're walking, looking very often at people who look for all intents and purposes as though they are normal and in fact are treated as though they're normal. The degree in which one can become conscious of that Come, how do they agree in which that individual can become conscious of the fact that they're on the spectrum may give them a different approach to that? It's the young person who comes in who really is treated as though they're on the spectrum. Yeah, so I, I think recognizing our own processes, 
right? Recognizing um, that we have our own sensory, pro that everybody in here, right? I forget what the acronym is, but the part of the brain that takes in the light, right? Or even the part of the brain that filters out the sensory processing. So if I'm looking at you, my brain is filtering out the flag in the back or kneel behind you or the chairs, right? My, from my periphery vision. So the more in tune you become to understanding your own cognitive and behavioral processes and the nuance to them, the, the greater the awareness to the degree to which a person with a disability experiences those processes in a different, maybe more extreme, less efficient, whatever it is, a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's that empathy to the story of you know, uh, the, the, the happy hour I was at where everybody was blind and, and recognizing like that I was so intrigued being as close to I, as I was or as I am to the disability community. At that time, I still hadn't had that experience of being an adult out at a bar with a whole bunch of people that did not have sight that managed to get to the bar, makeup on, clothes matched, had friends that they had seen time and time again. Um, that's that level of, of empathy when it comes to our sensory perception and understanding. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for being here with us. Thank tonight. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much, Michelle, for yes. taking time out of your night to chat with us and answer some questions. Um, so I invite everybody, you can have some more pizza or drinks and hang out a little bit longer. Um, but again, thank you for tonight. Thank you. It was a pleasure.